Well, Coach Miller, thank you so much for joining him in this episode of Lynch for the Leader. It is an honor to have you. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. It, it kind of gives me a little taste of season and the hustle and the bustle and the podcast and learning and sharing. So um, I'm anxious for everything to start. You know, it's funny you said learning and, and I want to tag that and then we're going to dive into some stories here. You seem like somebody who's constantly learning. I've listened to so many of your interviews, read so much articles about you. What is it about learning, whether it's the game of basketball or leadership or like, what is it about learning that excites you? Well, I mean, I'm going to be a much better coach tomorrow than I am today, 10 years ago, 10 years from now that I am today. So I, I just don't ever want to be satisfied with what I know and my knowledge. I mean, um, the world really is a big place and I'm just a small, small part of it. But if I can try to learn from others and grow from others and share my experiences, you just really kind of have this global view of making the world a better place. And I tell my kids often just kind of grow where you're planted mm. and God has placed you here, wherever here is, you know, here could be at Grand Canyon University here could be working your way through school here could be, you know, on the, on the front lines in a medical um, field. So I think wherever God has placed you, you're in the perfect position to do his will. Mm. So that's kind of the grow where you're planted mentality. And we've all heard the grass isn't always greener. It's yep. greener where you water it. That's a good old adage. So yep. we're kind of thinking as, you know, how do we grow? How do we learn where we're planted? How do we share? So I'm always wanting to learn more and more and more. And then I'm also wanting to help others to where maybe I was a, in a position, you know, 10 years ago when I was just getting into coaching and just starting this gig I wanted to pick everyone's brain and I wanted people to be available for me so I've got to do that that same service um, for my colleagues and my peers so I'll often do a lot of clinics and I'll, I'll put my heart and soul into those and podcasts like this one yep. or just be open and available because I think it's really important to share that knowledge that's really good and you know and I hear that in your teaching and I hear that in your interviews that it's not just about arriving but it is about learning and continuing to grow but passing it back off because I heard a guy ask you one time you're willing to pretty much share a lot of your secrets of, <laughs> of what makes your defense unique or your press all the things about it and your response was well I mean it, it's out there. It's on film. So that yeah. says a lot about you. It really does say a lot about you and your heart. You've had an incredible career, Coach. You, From your playing days, uh, your incredible record in high school and college of 219 wins, 32 losses um, as a coach, you, you have won at every level whether you're playing, whether it's at D2, now you're Division One. When little Molly Carter was growing up in Springfield, Missouri, did you ever dream your life would end up like it's ending up? No, and, and that's what's so fun about life. You have no idea the twists and turns. You have a vision, and I think, you know, sometimes God says, nope, that's not what I have in <laughs> store for you. And you have to accept and, and take it a day by at a time, and um, my mom has a, a great saying that she used, you know, don't die a thousand deaths in this mm -hmm. life, you know, don't worry and don't be anxious. There's a plan and you can, you have a lot of control, but also don't, don't live life in fear and, and anxiety. And I think that's something as I've, I've been pretty lucky to find the right fits for me and have really great experiences, whether it was as a player or as a coach starting out coaching at my alma mater, what a blessing that was. And then finding a place like Grand Canyon, who is really supportive of my vision for a program. So you take all those things and, you know, not every day is going to be perfect, but that's where you really learn from some of the adversity that comes with yeah. jobs or a student athlete, um, whatever it may be. I think it's got to be a tool for learning. And I've uh, every stop along the way, like I said, I'm super competitive and I want to win. And we've been in a place to do that, but it hasn't been easy. So I think something that keeps me grounded often is the work um, that it requires. And I embrace that and I, and I enjoy it. What did your, you mentioned your mom, 
What did your parents do right with you while you were growing up? So you're becoming a great basketball player. What did your parents do well that other parents could learn from? You know, I, to me, I think of they were the model behavior. You know, you're always going to look and see how your parents are acting, reacting, handle situations. And that is how you're going to act, react and handle mm-hmm. situations. So I just think the lesson learned how they lived out their life for me is powerful. Um, I, I know that they're very honest, hardworking people. So that's something that I saw every single day. Um, and I felt a lot of love growing mm. up, love from my parents. And um, that's important, I think, in, in your young and formidable years to feel that love. And coaching's, coaching parallels parenting yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I became a better coach when I was a, became a parent because there is there's definitely some tough love and discipline involved. Um, but there's a lot of support and a lot of hugs and, and tears and laughs and joy and all the above. So I was very fortunate um, as, a, as a child growing up just to have great examples. You know, it's you never want to be in a situation, do, do as I say, not as I do. You know, I saw both. I saw yep. both all the action and the words kind of align. So um, my dad is pretty competitive. He played every sport under the moon and he was smart with me as a kid. He used the old reverse psychology trick, you know, to, Molly, don't worry about your left-handed layup. You know, when I was about 10 years old, you're not, you're not strong enough. That'll come when you get stronger and you get older and um, you'll figure it out. It'll be okay, but you might just not be there you right now. So I marched right out to the driveway to the basketball hoop and worked on my left hand of layup till about dark that night just to prove him wrong. So that is so good. You know, make it a game too. I think yeah. he knew what he was doing. <laughs> oh yeah, he was reverse side. He was he was inside going, Oh yeah, she bit. She bit. Yep. <laughs> she bit it. Yeah. You know, and then my we, freshman year in high school, he was like, all right, all the kids, if you guys graduate valedictorian of your class, we'll give you a budget, but you can pick out the car you want to take to college, you know? And so that was a, the big carrot that he dangled in front of us. So four years later, I was driving my little Acura MDX um, <laughs> with a valedictorian star on my, <laughs> my cap. So that's, it's, it's fun. You know, I just remember those things and the influence your parents have uh, growing up and now in adulthood, I, I think I'm a lot like them. That's so funny. You know, uh, Clint Eastwood said low motivation is better than no motivation. So your dad really did know what he was doing to get you motivated. So you, you graduate high school, you go off to play at jury and I've heard you say you're five, six, right? So you're, you're the height of my wife. That's Uh, generous probably. (laughs) (laughs) Well, listen, who's measuring now? Who's measuring now? What was the staple of your game? What was it that made you so fierce and a great competitor? What would you say? Well, I you had to earn your keep somehow on the court because I wanted to play. And so I just really, the effort on the court, you know, I, my motor was something mm. that never quit. And, you know, coaches love that when you've got a kid that's going all out all the time. And then defensively, you know, that's where I earned my keep. I was, like I said, my five, six stature. I was a little ankle biter. So (laughs) I just got after it defensively, took charge, diving on the, I would guard the best player a lot of times. And I had a lot of pride in that. So yeah, I I wasn't a great shooter by any means. Um, I could score it a little bit, was aggressive pretty quick, but defensively like lockdown mentality was my mode all the time. So that's where I really earned my stripes on the defensive end and um, had a lot of success just buying into that side of the ball. So now as a coach, you can imagine what we're doing about 75% of the time in practice. (laughs) Yep. So, you know, and you end, you end your playing career with a 221 and 27 record third team, all American finished top three in program history for points, assists, and steals, but yet you left basketball and got out of it for a few years. You were going a whole nother direction. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, you know, I thought my father was a counselor. And um, so he worked at the school. And I honestly, in my mind, I love the sport. 
I had a very high basketball IQ. I was kind of the, the leader on the court as a point guard, but coaching never really entered my mind. I, I, mm. I kind of wanted to be in the marketing and out, you know, wheeling and dealing and PR. That's kind of where I'm a, I love people building relationships. My sister went the opposite direction. She's, she's really a good relationship builder, but she's an accountant. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, she, so I thought, you know, maybe to stay in coaching, you'd have to get your teaching degree and then teach, you know, seventh grade science. And, you know, I wanted to be out, you know, I wanted yep. to be selling something or doing something. And so I just, I didn't end up getting any sort of teaching certificate. So I thought kind of coaching was out of the question for me. I got my MBA and when I was in my MBA, um, the president of a neurosurgery group was, Hey, you know, we got a marketing position open. Would you be interested in the plot? And I was like, yeah, this is going to be great experience just to get an interview experience yep. for me. You know, growing up, you play AU basketball. There's not a lot of time for a summer job. So in no way I thought that I was going to land that job, but you know, a few weeks later I got offered the marketing director of a neuro neurosurgery group in Springfield. And it was wonderful for me. That's, it was kind of like a dream job and I loved it. But then about three years into it, the assistant job came open at Drury where I played and I kind of approached the coach then and he had coached me for a year um, at Drury and said, would you encourage or discourage me to apply for this position? He's like, heck yeah, I'd encourage it. So I was the assistant coach then and started at the college level. So very grateful for that opportunity because half the battle is how do you get your foot in the door? That's right. So obviously for me, I had proven through four years of playing at my alma mater that, you know, I, I couldn't be trusted with hard work and, um, you know, that I was the right person of the job. I didn't know it at the time, but for four years, I was essentially maybe interviewing for that job and that's right. head coach. So that's something I tell my kids all the time, you know, how you do anything is how you'll do everything. And I didn't know where my future would lead after college, but it was probably a working document <laughs> just based on my everyday life before I landed that job. So it was just, um, again, I think a God thing that put me back in basketball. And I don't think I'm going back to the corporate world anytime soon. Let's just say that. <laughs> but you know what's so interesting, and I'm super involved in college athletics, especially in the baseball world. It's not like it's a lateral move between what you were doing in the corporate world to go be an assistant at your alma mater. So you're not making an equal financial move. So you're, you're stepping backwards a little bit. You're taking, Absolutely. especially after you've got your MBA, what was the why behind it? You know, I, I know John Gordon's been a guest on the podcast and John's a very good friend and, and John, John has the statement, you know, people don't burn out because of what they do. They burn out because they forget why they do what they do. What's your why? What was the why that drove you back into coaching? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a pay cut. So that was not the why. No. <laughs> but I just knew how much I enjoyed being around the game and what mm. the game gave to me. So if I could recreate that as kind of a thank you to give something back to the game and the students that were going to be a part of the game and influenced by my new position, then that's definitely more and have fun doing it. That's right. That's <laughs> right. I mean, I wake up and it's a grind. Coaching is tough. You see a lot of coaches, especially female coaches get out of the business because it is so demanding, but I really just enjoyed every day waking up and being an impactful part of these kids' lives while doing it around a sport I love. It's like, mm. like you probably can't get better than that. People go a lifetime without, you know, saying they've done something that they love for work or a job. So I don't really see it as that. Is it, is it tough at times to be away from family when you're out on the road recruiting, you know, for months, you know, maybe at a time in the summer? Sure. Um, but to that point, I try to bring my family around the court and practice often. And that's an experience as kids that maybe other kids aren't experiencing because yeah. my jobs put me in that place. So I do try to balance it. Um, it's tough at times, but it's so rewarding, you know, probably more rewarding than I could say the corporate world for me, at least is. So you, you go back, you become an assistant. And then after a couple of years, you become the head at your alma mater and had a great run there. What did you learn being an assistant 
that you didn't know as a player about what it was going to take to be a great coach one day? If you had just been pulled right from corporate, put right into the head coaching role, what would you have missed you needed to know that you learned being an assistant coach, leading from the second chair? Yeah, well, probably all the ground level things that really run a program that are probably thankless. You know, that's first and foremost. I want to make sure that my assistants feel valued and appreciated and has a lot of ownership in what the program looks like and the success of a program. Um, how to treat assistants, you know, I think that's something for me. How you treat people in general matters. And there's all these nuances that goes into running a program. And as an assistant, you have to know all of them. As a head coach, sometimes you just expect them to be done. Like mm -hmm. how this calendar um, get constructed? Well, an assistant went and got schedules and looked at everyone's and plugged in holes and then looked at facility availability. Like there's a lot as an assistant that you do. Um, it's definitely appreciated within the program. So for me, that's that was the biggest thing is just getting that ground level experience. <clears throat> I dabbled in a lot as an assistant. So you just grow that knowledge and you're able to understand what it takes to, to run a program. Yeah. So when you, when you think about coach being a leader, being, being somebody that these girls have, they've got a role model to look up to and they have a person that they get, but you still have to lead the program how do you how do you grow as a leader how are you learning you didn't you didn't just learn and get leadership by osmosis how did you begin the process of growing as a leader as an assistant and now as a head coach it's definitely a process i mean i think as an assistant I probably grinded too much and i kind of wanted to put up this this front as you know i'm your coach first and foremost you know, I need that respect because I was a little close in age, you know, and I, I didn't, I, I wanted to set kind of that boundary. Now I'm probably even more a little bit lax in the terms of, you know, forming relationships outside the, the coach role. I do not want an invisible sign, you know, following me around that says head coach, do not approach. Yeah. You know, I, don't, <laughs> I don't want that. Um, so just outside the court stuff, how I, how I learn and how I lead, I'm, I'm very much of the belief that I can't be this coach that coaches everyone the same way. Mm. You know, you, you, I'm going to, I'm dealing with a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different Enneagram types, a lot of different personality traits. So how I motivate Susie is definitely going to be different than how I motivate mm. Sally. That's the biggest thing I think a leader can learn is mm. what buttons to push, what support different athletes need, um, just getting to know them, how they tick, how they work, how they think. So you can motivate them to the to the best of your ability just by knowing them from kind of the, the, their core and their inside out. So got a lot better of that. And I'm still working on that. You know, that's something that I still want to improve is just getting to know our players on a deeper level. So I understand, you know, how to motivate them and and be there for them. And that's something that leaders you, know, you just have to be able to be a little bit flexible and check your ego every once in a while. You know, you, you, I might be able to tell Susie that, you know, hey, you're on the line if you're not running because you're making too many mistakes and that would motivate her. But I might have to tell Sally, like, put my arm around her. Like, hey, you can do it. We're going to have short-term memory on this one and just move on and, and don't worry. I'm not worried about that mistake. You don't need to be worried about that mistake. So I'm still always probably as a general rule going to try to lead with, um, you know, a firm hand and a gentle heart. I've said that before. You, you, I think kids want to be coached. They, they want to be challenged. They want to have high expectations, but they've got to know that you're coming from a good place. And at the end of the day, that's kind of a mom in me too. You know, my kids know they love me, but I'm constantly challenging them to clean up their room or, you know, read another book or spend some more time um, on their letters. So it's, they got to find, they got to know there, there's a balance, but it, everything's coming from a place of love. What's been, what's been an area you've really had to grow in the most as you assume this mantle. So you become the assistant, at your alma mater, you become the head, having a phenomenal run at Drury. Then you get the head coach at a D one university at Grand Canyon. 
And you, as you said earlier, you're consistently having to learn, consistently having to grow. What has been the area of being a head coach and a leader that's probably stretched you the most? Um, I, I definitely push, you know, I, I'm very high in what I demand and the standards. So I think even forgiveness is an area of, you know, kids might not be having the best day. I, I want them to in my early years, especially, I want to be on point all the time. Well, that's that's unrealistic for anyone. Mm. Um, so my husband and my kids, and then I call them my basketball kids, yeah. I think they've really taught me what forgiveness looks like. And it's kind of a, a declaration of a lifestyle, really. And you, you don't want to turn away from that. And, you know, God shows us mercy. I think that as a coach, you can be so narrow-minded sometimes on this one track mind of more, more push, push success, success. So I think there's some trusting there that there's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days. It's just what your culture is built on, how you handle those things. So I'm a perfectionist at nature, you know, and, and to me, not everything's going to be perfect. So I've had to figure out how to navigate those waters. That's really good. Who have you learned from the most? Who are some coaches? Who are some leaders that you've looked out ahead of you and said, I like how they handle that? Who are some people you've learned from? Yeah, I, I was so fortunate to be coached by Nyla Millison. She was the architect of the program at Drury University. So there was not a um, basketball program there for very long before I decided to commit and play. I think it'd been in existence about four years before I decided to go there. So <clears throat> she built something from the ground up, but did it the right way. So I always admired how she, you know, it wasn't going to be, it, it was kind of instant success for her because I think she did it the right way, but um, she just led with this motherly instinct that I appreciated. Um you know, she, she was one to come up and give you a great big hug, um, but she'd chew your butt too, but you mm -hmm. didn't take that personally because she was hugging you at the end of the game. So I learned a lot from Nyla. And even to this day, when she went on to coach at Missouri State and just recently George Mason, and it's funny for her, it's came full circles. She's the AD at Drury now where she wow. started the basketball program. Now she's in charge. So um I still call her. She's on speed dial and we've got a great relationship, but the relationships changed over time. You know, at one yeah. point she was my coach. Now she's my mentor and my peer and I were bouncing ideas off of each other. So I love that in coaching. I see how it came full circle. <clears throat> I haven't quite got that. It, you know, I, I'm watching kids now get jobs. I've, I've got one kid that I coach at jury. Now she's um, an ops person and she started as a GA. So now I'm starting to see it, but it's kind of fun as you grow and kind of age in this profession, right. how your branches and your networking extends. And a lot of it's from your former players. <laughs> It'll, it, that'll be the part that you will love the most as you get older is seeing. And I, I can only imagine how she feels when your number rings up, even though you may feel like, Oh my gosh, I hate to call her again. It, it, the satisfaction that goes, she's turned out so well, you know, and there's a, I did a wedding this past weekend for, it was the first wedding I've done of a child that, of a couple that I married 25 years ago. And I'm standing there and there's the dad bringing his daughter down the aisle. And I remember when he was waiting on his bride who's now the mother of the bride and it's just this full circle and you're like well this is why you do it though it's the you know you're in the people business you're not in the basketball business you're in the people business and that's a really that's a really cool answer you know part of what you do is working with athletes part of what you do is is now becoming up you said they're my I'm they're my kids they're my basketball kids if you could set every high school parent down and you're recruiting these kids, what would you tell them about failure and letting their kids fail that will help their kids later? What would you say? Yeah, I mean, you let them, <laughs> let them fail. Um, I think there's so much pressure on these kids with these exposure events. Um, you kind of lose sight of the goal in the first place, which was play a game you love 
you know, the goal is not to have as many college coaches notice you and get exposed and get fill the shoe box up with as many scholarship offers as you can. That's a byproduct of playing the game. And if you work hard enough and you're invested and it's a positive experience for you, then that stuff will come. Like you'll be noticed by coaches. And if you have the skill level, you'll be able to play in college on a scholarship, but you can't lose sight of really hopefully why they started at five years old. And they said, I want to do that again. You know, when's basketball practice? And so I think really good coaches can, and parents can extend that love for the game and help funnel and, and foster appropriate growth. That's not as, as pressured because when they come to college then, and, and they might not be the best one on the team because right. they're playing with a bunch of different kids that were the best one on their team. How do they handle that? What does that look like? Because, you know, basketball is a metaphor for life. Yep. When you get outside those um, scholastic doors, there's a whole new set of challenges mm. for you and how you've, you've handled those challenges. There, there needs to be challenges to be able to handle as you, you grow and become a um, steward of the community. So I think it's important to stay focused on some goal setting. Everyone wants to have goals, but you know, maybe it's not get 10 scholarship offers. Maybe it's improve my three point shooting this summer <laughs> and then you'll see where that takes you. So keeping the fun and the enjoyment in the game and um, not having to be stressed about summer basketball. I think that's a, a big thing right now is just go out there and play. You've done the hard work and you earn what you get and you get what you earn. So, that's right. Spoken well, like a coach. <laughs> Spoken. That was a very, very nice answer there. <laughs> you know, I've heard you talk to a lot, coach, about culture and camaraderie. How important. So you've got these it was a perfect example this week. All these girls are coming in. They're meshing in with a group of girls who are returning from last year. As a leader, how do you begin to build culture? And how do you begin to build camaraderie knowing there's only so much you can do to make that happen? What would you say? Yeah, I, I think you have to, during the recruiting process, that's what's really important for me because I've probably passed on some kids that were good enough to play on our program, but would not enhance our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a responsibility to the kids that are already here. <laughs> that's right. Sure bringing in like-minded people. I mean, those are my kiddos. I want to protect them in a sense. So I always revert back to, you know, can they play basketball? Sure. That is that going to be a requirement? You know, are they, are they doing um, the work in the classroom necessary? Sure. That's going to be an, a requirement, but are they going to be able to enhance our culture? Are they good human beings that are going to be on the same page of our current kids or kids that we're bringing in. So I think that happens getting to know them through the recruiting process. And I'm a head coach that's very involved in the recruiting process, but I'm also a head coach that's slow to offer. And the method behind that madness is just making sure that it's going to be a good fit. So I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, checking the boxes for the recruit because they want it to be a good fit, but I'm also checking the boxes for my, my program because Culture is tricky. It's, it's a hard thing to establish, but it's even harder to maintain because <laughs> you get maybe one bad apple that can ruin the bunch and you're starting from ground zero. Um, I've just been so enthusiastic with the, these first couple days of our kids getting on campus. I mean, six of them here were last night, six of them were here before 9am today, and we're not even starting, you know, workouts yet. They're just anxious and chomping at the bit and they see that and they, and they see, you know, what it takes and then their teammates see that and they join in and it's a fun trickle down effect. But I also think when you're kind of living your lifestyle and I'm probably going to revert back to the beginning of this podcast, what does the model behavior look like? Right. You know, for, for me and, and what my parents taught me, I've got to be a good example for these kids. You know, I, if I'm going to, ask them to hold standards at a certain level, I've got to hold myself to those same standards. So I think it definitely starts at the top. We've got a great group. Our assistants are phenomenal. Our support staff is so good. So that's something, the touch points that the kids get early on, 
um, with strength and conditioning, with the trainers, with the academic team coordinator, with the nutritionist, that all plays a big part into culture. So you want people surrounding you who have the same vision that you do for your program. Throughout all your interviews, everything I've read about you, following you on Twitter, your faith is huge to you. And I, and, and I don't think you're a coach who just says, well, I go to church and I'm a Christian. I was at a baseball, hosted a baseball conference a few years ago in a coach at Dallas Baptist, Coach Hefner. He, he said, I'm a kingdom coach. I'm building I'm not just a Christian baseball coach. I'm a kingdom coach. How huge is your faith, not just to you, but to how you coach? What would you say? Well, I, I think faith-based coaches and faith-based leaders can help be solutions and be a part of kind of that, that grace and the, the healing that the world needs right now. Um, you know, I, 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 I coach a team that's multiracial, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. That's what the community, the church should look like. That's right. That's right. And we're wearing the same uniform on the same team, you know, cheering each other on, setting these goals together, um, coming together as a unit, but all different backgrounds. Like that's what the community should look like. So I think that, um, we play together, we work together, we live together, kind of modeling those behaviors of Christ right here and then spreading our wings to model that for everyone else. I've been in a, put in a position to do that. How lucky am I to get to relate and um, build relationships with these kids that come from all parts of the country, different backgrounds. There's a, a tremendous amount of damage that have been done in our communities recently. And um, I think if we can come together and show them what it should look like, mm. that's a powerful thing um, that God has connected us to do. And so I think it's important to, I've, I've used it a lot of times, it kind of be that model behavior for people to look at. And you do have a little bit of an extra platform that you can use. Um, and so we're going to use it in a way to teach, learn, understand, and hopefully when there's some hardships in our communities and in the country we're in, we can kind of be spotlighted as this is what it looks like to come together and unite. And they're not the same. They don't look the same. They don't act the same. They don't talk the same. They don't have the same ideas. They came from different backgrounds, but look at them uniting. So. You know, that there's a verse in, in the new Testament. It said, and David served his purpose in his generation. And then he was gone. Then he died. When God knit Molly together long ago, and he put you together, what do you think was the purpose he created you for? What do you think when he knit you together so uniquely, and he made you five, six, and not six, four, and he gave you the passion and the grit and all those little intrinsics and the mom and dad that he did? What do you think was the purpose he created you for? Well, um, hindsight will probably be 2020. Hopefully when I'm looking <laughs> at my life in heaven someday. But I, right now, I believe, you know, in, in my thirties um, and I, I do think it's a working document. So I think it'll change the older I get my purpose and, and how my, my knitting and my fibers change and grow as I grow. But really my, my mom says too, she's, you know, it's wonderful to get out and give and give to the community and um, donate, like all those things we've kind of been brought up and taught to do and give back. But the one thing you can do for this world is raise your children, right? Raise your children to contribute, raise your children to go out and make a difference in society. I've been blessed with, you know, 13 to 17 more children every year. <laughs> You know, I've got two of my own, but in coaching, I'm surrounded by children most of the year that are my basketball kids, as I call them. But if there's one purpose in life, you know, every time they cycle through and a new year begins and we flip the page on a new season, how am I developing these kids to go out into the world and be not only a success individually, but be a part of our society in the best way possible? So that's what 
kind of now seeing where I'm at at this moment in time is my purpose.